Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to welcome Carson Reynolds, a good friend and colleague of mine from MIT Media Lab. Uh, now, currently Carson is assist, assistant project prof, professor at University of Tokyo, and uh, he's going to talk about personal space and automatically learned social networks. Carson. Great. Uh, thanks for hosting me, Ashish. And um, I, I'm, I hope that this talk will be kind of uh, interesting overview of some issues in privacy, but also some new technology, which uh, was developed by myself, but also my collaborators at uh, Mitsubishi Electric Research, uh, Chris Wren and Yuri Ivanov. So uh, let me just jump right into it. Uh, I, I thought I've been doing some recent reading into the history of privacy and technology and trying to understand where some of our modern attitudes come from. And I have this little thumbnail history of how privacy arrived to be like a central issue in technology design now. Um, so this is a word cloud from an article which was written in uh, the 1890s by two professors at Harvard, um, Brandeis and Warren. And uh, they, in this landmark article, basically argued for the right to privacy or the right for people to be let alone. And um, it didn't exist in common law in the US at all, uh, really, until the advent of some modern inventions like photography and gossip columns. So suddenly, when people could take photographs of people and use that as blackmail material, or people could use gossip columns to cause emotional distress to people, then it started entering common law and tort law, and it became possible for people to defend their right to protect images of themselves, their likeness, all these sorts of ideas. So I, I think that article shows a really tight connection between inventions and in technology and changing attitudes and privacy and legal practices altogether. Really interesting article also, definitely worth a read. So um, some more sort of modern updates. Uh, in, in 1998, uh, Nissenbaum made a, a pretty persuasive argument that modern data mining technologies present a new problem of privacy in the public sphere. So it used to be that unless someone hired a private investigator, per, perhaps like the artist uh, Sophie Call, for instance, like uh, hired a private investigator to track herself. And if you're have, under very close cert scrutiny from one individual, then your public activities could give away details of your private life. But in normal interactions and everyday behavior, that's not really a problem. But Nissenbaum was arguing that data mining basically means that if you look at someone's public activities, you can infer a lot of things about their private life that you couldn't infer before. And this is a new problem that we need to, to work on. Um, a, sort of a, a contrasting opinion is that of uh, Solov, who wrote a taxonomy of privacy in 2006. And he thinks that there's really no connection between technology and privacy at all, but instead that privacy problems or violations are actions by people, businesses, or groups altogether. So things like blackmail, extortion, have analogs with privacy invasion, and you should just cover them that way. There's no sense in even thinking about technology. So he has kind of the, the contrasting point of view. I'm not really totally sure that I agree with it, but uh, I'm starting to develop my own ideas of uh, maybe a different theory of privacy. Um, but before talking about that, I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about technology and um, privacy issues with social network analysis that are starting to emerge. Um, an early project by Kautz and Selman uh, called Referral Web uh, crawled the web and looked for bibliographical entries and tried to make networks of collaborators on papers. So this was done in 1998. And here on the, uh, on the right on this slide, he's showing a search between himself and Rabiner, who is at uh, AT&T Speech Labs, showing their sort of social network connection. This is now, I think, pretty commonplace today. When we use things like LinkedIn or Facebook, we can find connections between people. But this was some sort of early pioneering work. And what's more interesting is that this social network wasn't hand entered, but it was crawled. It was gathered from the web. So there's a little robot that went around and parsed web pages and built this, uh, these models up. Um, 
uh, Tanzim Chaudhry and uh, Sandy Pentland in 2002 made a wearable device which people could use to assess interpersonal interaction. The bottom left hand corner here is an image uh, where the row and column uh, of that image represent uh, people and the dark and light areas represent activity. So that would be kind of a, another automatic approach to gauge social interactions or activity and social connections, but one that relies on wearable hardware. Um, so a little bit more on the provocative side was a project by uh, Jernigan and Mystery in 2009 called uh, GADAR, which is a system which was using uh, Classifier to predict the sexual orientation of people on Facebook. So what they had found was that there were some uh, information which was exposed by Facebook which uh, could be used to, with a certain degree of accuracy, estimate the sexual orientation of people. And I think that they really did this not as a, you know, a real application or something that's a good thing, but as a provocation to make people think a little bit differently about what happens when you have uh, kind of data mining technologies and social networks in collision with one another. Um, so maybe this comic, just as a sort of bit of levity, uh, I think is appropriate. Uh, I think that right now the programmers and designers of social networking technologies are uh, kind of faced with a lot of decisions that run right into the right to privacy and this sort of problems that uh, actually have some legal implications, but um, uh, also can mean a lot to a business's success or failure. I think there's been a lot of debate with Facebook, for instance, about uh, whether uh, some of their uh, business arrangements have undermined the privacy of users of Facebook and a lot of concern uh, along those lines. Although Facebook has taken a pretty aggressive stance of giving people a lot of options about how to protect their privacy. Some people say too many options, but options all the same. So um, I'm going to talk then now pretty directly about a project which I was involved with, which is a little bit of a provocation, but also uh, trying to understand what people are comfortable with in terms of gathering social network information automatically and what's usable. And at the same time that we're, we developed this technology, we were simultaneously trying to assess the privacy implications and how people felt about it, whether it's an acceptable thing to do, whether it's... Mm, as we'll see later, a, a creepy activity or a trustworthy activity, those sorts of distinctions. So um, these are some photos from Chris Wren. Uh, the sensor network that uh, was built at Merle with about uh, 500 different nodes used these uh, motion detectors, which were sort of off-the-shelf parts uh, readily available, and basically just trigger when someone is near. I mean, I, I think. Many people by their home have an object where there's a light that turns on automatically when someone walks into a general area, same sort of technology. Um, these were combined with a, a board which was developed at MIT, which had uh, power supply and microcontrol uh, circuitry and uh, radio frequency transmitter into a package so that we had a wireless sensor network with about 500 nodes. Uh, this is a picture of Chris on some stilts walking around the office sticking these things on the ceiling um, at Mitsubishi. So uh, what you see here is there's a floor plan, uh, the seventh and eighth floor, and in the white boxes here are people's offices at Mitsubishi. The gray area is a map of the hallways, and in those gray cells there were sensor nodes uh, in the public areas between offices. So this is a, a map. In each of these cells you have one of these uh, wireless sensor devices, and uh, what is shown here statically is a set of uh, activations. So if someone walk down, walks down a hall, there would be a series of activations one after another that can be recorded. So if you have that series of activations and you have time, then you can have a vector of someone sort of moving out of their office into the hallway, down to someone else's office and into it. Um, of course, there's a little bit of ambiguity to this problem. Two people leave their offices at the same time and then they cross in the hallway and the system isn't totally certain exactly who went where because there's a moment where they might have stopped to talk for a second or just crossed paths. So there's a problem of disambiguating, which can be worked out eventually if you assume that eventually the person's going to return to their own office. You can kind of figure out where people went. So uh, this technology, which was developed by Chris, is, is called Tracklets. Uh, it's just kind of some basic 
uh, pattern recognition within the motion sensor data set. So um, they also had done some work with computer vision and camera systems. This is a, a, a video capture from a system which we developed at the University of Tokyo, which uses a, you know, a stereo arrangement of camera to have a kind of a 3D motion tracker that could be used for people. But um, primarily the system used these uh, IR systems and not camera technology. So from that sense, it was kind of uh, privacy preserving. It's not taking pi pictures of people and that's not personally identifiable. So there's a degree of deniability. Anyway, let me just uh, jump through some quick math. Um, so in addition to this motion sensor data set, we collected some other data sets. One was uh, basically email logs from Mitsubishi during the same time period about who is emailing who, how often. And then another data set was actually a survey which went out where we asked people, how well do you know such and such person in the office? And we asked everybody in the office how well they knew one another. So we kind of thought of that survey as a variety of ground truth. This is what people really believe in terms of how well they know one another. Uh, whereas we thought the email and the sensor data sets would be kind of some approximation of that ground truth. So um, we had this problem which arises, which is how do you compare the value of an email versus the value of visiting someone in their office? It's not necessarily like a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Like, is it that five emails equal one office visit, or does it matter how long the person's in the other person's office? I mean, there's a lot of kind of tricky questions when it comes to comparing these sorts of values. So we just sidestepped all of that by saying, uh, you know, if a person emailed someone, then we have this binary adjacency matrix, which would be denoting a one. Otherwise, there is a zero. So you have this kind of one and zero pattern based on contact or no contact. Um, likewise, if someone visited, one, otherwise zero, or uh, if the person said they knew the person, one, otherwise zero. So we can, we can then start to transform those binary adjacency matrices into uh, some different models. So um, on the left here are different uh, binary adjacency matrices, and on the right are their graph analogs, which just show the, in, the connectivity between people. So, um, so what we wanted to do was compute some metrics on those matrices, which let us find out how similar they are to one another. So one that we used is so-called Hamming distance. Uh, Hamming distance is uh, large when strings are completely dissimilar to one another. So if we take the matrix and just emit a bunch of ones and zeros and then start comparing our, our ones and zeros, if there's agreement, the Hamming distance will be really small. If there's disagreement, the Hamming distance will be really large. Um, a different metric which we cooked up was this notion of jacquard edges. So uh, the jacquard metric basically says, let's look at a set and let's take the intersection and divide it by the union. Um, the jacquard edges will be large when there's perfect match with two sets or two graphs. So um, then there's these kind of bubbles which are plotted above that. Um, the the blue bubble here is the survey data set. Th this was people saying they knew one another. Uh, the green bubble here is the email data set. So this is our, our actual data, visualization, visualization of our actual data. So the green bubble is basically saying that uh, we have a pretty small amount of coverage over the actual social connections from just email alone. Whereas this orange bubble is what we gathered from the sensor networks. And you can see that there's some bit of non-overlap here, that's misclassifications uh, or misidentifications where email said there was a social network or a social connection where the surveys did not or the uh, sensor data did where the survey did not. So what we can see from j this visualization of jacquard edges was that the sensor network had uh, a greater span over the social connections and actually it also had fewer misclassifications compared to email. Although later on I'll talk about this other aspect of email that was interesting. Um, so here's just kind of a table, table and a quick listing of uh, the hypothesis of the experiment which we were conducting, which is that uh, if you uh, have social network structure which was reported that we can estimate that using a set sensor network. And we also made uh, a statement about using fuse data where we take email from the sensors and the email and put them together to get even a better image. Um, and it turns out that when we fuse the data with jacquard edges, we get about 88% uh, recognition rate 
relative to the survey ground truth. Um, and Hamming distance shows that about 12% of the, uh, the, the estimation or the 12% of the graph was mistaken. That, so that's our, our sort of current results. Um, so at this point, we did some more exploratory data analysis. And what we found was that um, on the survey, everybody said pretty much that they knew everyone in the office. It was a relatively small office with 30 people, and most of them knew one another. But from the standpoint of like sensor engineering, we would say it's like saturated. <laughs> it's, the ground truth is almost always positive, which is kind of a little bit of a bad target to, to go after. But we thought maybe we should do some different analysis and start thinking about you know, comparing uh, the sort of weighting different types of activity or different levels of activity. So one characteristic of a graph is the degree distribution. And what we can see is if we look at the degree distribution for the various uh, data sets that I have here, the survey data set is completely saturated. Email data set is, has some sort of natural looking or normal looking distribution. Sensors looks like it's normal, but we're only getting one tail of it, like it's too far to one side, et cetera. So we went through this process where we started doing different levels of thresholding and trying to find the level of threshold with each of the data sets which maximized the de degree distribution so that we would get, like in the case here of the survey data, people said that they saw each other once a week. We have something which looks like a normal distribution altogether. So in, in doing that sort of analysis and um, kind of putting it into R and using iGraph and comparing the centrality of different figures in the network, we end up with a situation where in some of the data sets there, the most central figure is the same between the email data set and the survey data set. Um, so that is a little bit more of a um, kind of in-depth approach that one could take to start waiting or trying to process the social network such that uh, one has a kind of a Gaussian-like target as opposed to something which is always on or always off. And I think that might be an interesting approach to take. So uh, OK, but I started talking about privacy. And now I just gave you a whole bunch of kind of machine learning sort of stuff. Uh, and th the question is, yeah, OK, but what did people think? <laughs> like, uh, if you're in this environment and these things are tracking your behavior, what, what do people think about that? So. The way that we approached this was we, of course, we surveyed the people at Mitsubishi Electric Research, these 30 users. But we got a control group of people on Craigslist who had never encountered the system at all. And we got equal numbers of the control people and then these people who used it. And these are just some basic demographic pieces of information. Um, the, I think the main difference was that most of the people at Mitsubishi Electric Research have doctoral degrees. So you might assume they're a bit more of a technical audience. And they skew to be a slightly, a little bit older. But for the most part, there's a lot of similarities between these two groups. Um, so we asked people uh, with a whole bunch of different technologies how invasive they felt those technologies were if they were used to track their behavior and try to guess their social network connections. So on the far left, as most invasive, we have mobile phone monitoring. People do not like the idea of tracking conversations on mobile phones. It seems like a very, very sensitive area. On the far right, uh, we have security guards. I guess people, security guards are pervasive. And people don't really have strong opinions about people talking to security guards and trying to glean information from them. But in the middle, there's uh, a lot of kind of gray areas. But in this one point, which is kind of interesting, was that when asked about motion sensor logs, the people who hadn't experienced the system thought that they were kind of above more on the invasive side, whereas the people at Mitsubishi who had spent a lot of time with the motion sensors didn't really feel they were invasive at all, probably because they just were familiar. They were there all the time, maybe like key card entry systems at Microsoft or other companies. When you use them every day, you probably think about them in a slightly different way. Um, then uh, this is kind of the kind of tough question which we asked, which is, uh, whether this whole activity is a creepy activity or a trustworthy activity. And what we find is that actually both sets of users, the uh, Merle set of users and the Craigslist users, felt that this is kind of creepy. And that might be an indication that people should think really carefully about how to, you know, if they want to do this you know, use this technology at all, 
uh, or how to kind of properly support trustworthiness for the technology. I think it's a, it's a complex issue. But uh, so uh, that's kind of what people thought. It was a little bit creepy. <laughs> And maybe at this point, this uh, uh, diagram, which was developed by Dave Max, would be kind of helpful. Um, mm, a, a lot of people's activities on the internet, uh, if this is a Venn diagram, if, if you want your privacy, anything you do on the internet is potentially not private and vice versa. It's a bit of a joke, actually. But uh, anyway. So um, I think in thinking a little bit more about this, instead of just having a negative viewpoint and saying, well, it's creepy, okay, should we just stop doing it? A different approach to take is that of trying to think about, well, okay, if people's personal information in private space is something which exists, maybe we ought to think about it as a design element or something that our interaction should be structured around. So if that's the case, how do you make something which takes into account someone's personal space and uses it uh, appropriately? So, um, I'm just going to skip that. Uh, one object I was going to talk about was some research I did well before we uh, worked on this analysis, which was um, so-called haptic radar system, which allows people to feel how close objects are to them and avoid things before they touch uh, the person. It uses some off-the-shelf infrared range sensor technology. And I actually have one of the little gadgets here. So if you want to play around with it later, you can uh, try it out. and, and uh, have a little demonstration, but um, let me show you uh, this video, which is uh, an excerpt from a TV in a TV show in Japan uh, about kind of recent research. So we built this device that this woman is wearing, which is a headband with the haptic radar uh, modules, and it allows her to avoid objects that she cannot see before they actually touch her at least in the areas where uh, the device is operating, which would be around the head. Um, so you, know, you could imagine this sort of device being used to create uh, some sort of system to protect people, of course, not from potential sexual harassment on television, but you know, all, all things aside. Um, uh, you could use this sort of technology to give someone a sense of personal boundary or how close objects are to them and avoid things um, it could also be used for people who are visually impaired. In fact, uh, one of my collaborators in this project, Alvaro Castanelli, has done some experiments with people who are uh, visually impaired and showing that they can avoid obstacles and move around. Um, a little bit later in this show, there's uh, some footage of a person doing some navigation around some obstacles. But, uh, so let me skip past that and talk about a project which is very much some work in progress, but is kind of motivating some of these ideas about how to make communication systems that have built-in protections for privacy and consent so that people feel more comfortable with using them. So this is a collaborative project with uh, Tomoko Hayashi, who's uh, uh, working in the Metaperception Research Group at, at my lab. Um, so in, in this model, uh, what we're imagining is that in two people's homes, there are some mirrors installed. And uh, these mirrors are uh, half-silvered mirrors, so they can use pepper ghost-type effects to act as both displays and a, a normal mirror, depending on what's back projected on them. We have a prototype of that kind of mirror system working in our lab, but for right now, I'm just going to show some mock-ups. So if you're going about your day and uh, no one is in the sort of, um, so if I approach the mirror, it just acts like a normal mirror when the other person is not around or available. Um, However, if both people are standing before the mirror and they're both gazing into the mirror and there is uh, contact between their gaze, then the functionality of the system switches and it becomes a little bit more like a teleconferencing system. So a video conference is initiated and they can see one another and talk to one another, et cetera. But um, the way that this object then works in the home is that there's a place and if I am just kind of uh, going about my day, it's normally a mirror, and I can't get any information about the other person. But if there's a special case where we're both thinking about one another and both looking at this object, which we associate with one another, then it initiates communication. So it requires this sort of variety of mutual consent. N neither person can sort of surreptitiously gain information about the activity 
of the other person inside their home, and yet they can still initiate communication. So it's a little bit more of a kind of a, a just an illustration of some property that we'd like to see uh, built in a little bit more frequently. But we're hoping to actually make a physical version of this so that people can try it and uh, have some more discussions around that. So yeah, I think with that, I'm just going to wind down. And uh, uh, I would be happy to have any questions. If you're watching this and uh, want to send questions uh, electronically, please send it to my Twitter address. And, uh, I mean, can we look at that haptic data? We can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you want to try it out, I, I think she's tried it a little bit before, but um, let's go ahead. So what is it actually doing? So uh, this is a, a infrared rangefinder, and on the back side, there's a, a motor vibrator, yeah. uh, just like you would find in a mobile phone. And when objects are far away, you can start getting light sensation, but as objects approach, more quickly, the the sensation gets more intense. So I'm just looking at the angle of reflection. That's true. It does depend on the reflectivity of the objects and the angle, but it, it pretty much works with uh, like walls or people. Uh, so yeah, you might start from kind of compress it as it were, like a like a, as if it was a balloon or something like that. And at some point, you'll probably find the activation threshold. And you can do some kind of funny experiments with that where if you are blindfolded and you have a few of those worn, you'll find that you can find your way out of the room and back down the hall towards the entrance or something because you, you can feel where the walls are before you encounter them or if someone is standing in front of you, you get an indication of that. Also depending on where you come from, you might have like, this is really far away and then maybe you don't want to feel anything. Mm. Maybe some people, they only want to know here. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We did make a version which was a little bit tunable, so you could kind of say, like, where's my, my, my body distance? Like, how far out do I want to know? I mean, you could think also with, like, a, a car, for instance. If you were driving a vehicle and you wanted to have this sort of behavior, you probably would want longer distances. You would want to know if there were some objects, you know, in the other lane or something like that. But it, it's interesting. And there's also, like, maybe different areas where people have different feelings. Like if someone touches someone's arm, people don't feel that that's kind of more of a natural interaction. Yeah, but the back is like. <laughs> yeah, the back or the head, people kind of have this startle reflex, which gets keyed up pretty quickly. So I think um, it might be interesting to think about designing some kind of object where I could uh, anticipate, even before someone touched me, that there's something coming or just kind of predict a little bit. Have you thought of using haptic as a way of communication? I have. You know, I, I guess when I spoke at Microsoft Research last time, I showed a diagram with all sorts of different varieties of haptic communication technology. And so this is just using vibration, which is really simple. And it's kind of more or less intense, depending on how close things are. But we tried a version using Peltier junctions to do kind of hot or cold and some sort of like cold shivers or kind of hot more sort of like less intense feelings. So that gives you like two-dimensional potential communication, although hot and cold switches rather slowly, so you couldn't really move quickly. I think in the past, Kathy, you had done some objects. Yeah, I think at SIGGRAPH there was a presentation that you'd done in 2006 about kind of haptic sensations and feeling. Using solenoids as well, like to give more sense of attack, which that back. And yeah. then we study, we saw that some people like prefer like, like this type of feedback rather than something vibrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, there's definitely some interesting stuff also with the solenoids and tapping, like the uh, kind of uh, rabbit illusion type effects where you can kind of get feelings of things moving in a particular area. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things to be done on the kind of haptic side of this, uh, in addition to just kind of thinking about. Uh, you know, if we take robotic sensors and start repurposing them and putting them on people, what ends up happening? But um, I think, though, for me, it kind of is an interesting design issue to kind of think about how to better support privacy, not necessarily have technology undermining or stripping away people's privacy, but actually making technologies that, like, in the same way that SSL or public key encryption can actually preserve people's privacy and protect it. Yeah. 
you see two in the space, like when you go in different, uh, you have lived in Europe and then now you live in Japan, it's going to be really different also in terms of physical boundaries. That's true, so. yeah. And definitely, it depends on context. I, I find in Japan, people often go to great lengths to avoid touching one another, except during the last subway <laughs> car of the day, in which case people are, yeah, people are all kind of crammed in. So at that point, it, you probably wouldn't want to wear something like that, because it would just be <laughs> overstimulation. <laughs> Carson, with, with your sensor-based social network discovery, it, your case was an environment where there, you know, as you said, where really most people knew each other and there was kind of high-frequency interaction. How do you think the discovery algorithm would be robust in a, in a kind of sparse network? You know, when you think about most online social networks, you know, hundreds and hundreds of friends that you kind of maintain in a superficial way, you know, how, do you think that first, uh, um, if you had a network, but it was kind of uh, weakly maintained uh, uh, in, a, in a physical environment, how would that be different? Secondly, mm. you know, as you start to discover a network, you know, it, it, my first day on the job, and you know, I start to make these kinds of meetings, mm. um, how robust do you think it would be to kind of ramp up this kind of sensor-based discovery? Those are both really, really good questions. I, I think um, in terms of uh, sparser networks, some of the people who have reviewed this work had commented that the social network we're dealing with is really small compared to the data sets that a company like Facebook would have access to, for instance. So, uh, and our network is really dense. So I think if we were using this exact same technology, which is motion trackers embedded in a much larger area, then I would predict that, um, for instance, you would have some individuals who would be kind of like strangers, like myself, coming into an area who and leaving the area who are not really associated with the social situation. Those sorts of folks, I don't think the system would ever be able to get a meaningful information unless they came several times over and over again. Eventually, you could start getting a track about this kind of, uh, what's the right word? Um, I guess it would be like a social bridging, some person who's coming from some other place and periodically connecting with the social network. Um, in terms of someone who's brand new and what happens to the system at first, I think at first they are, I mean, I guess to use the electrical engineering algae, they're noise. <laughs> like they're just something which isn't really regular or th there's no pattern to it. But over time, they probably become uh, something which is, is more meaningful. But I, actually, I, I should say with the current like uh, processing that we're using, if there was any contact between that person and other people, we would register it in the current system. But with a larger scale network, I think you'd have to do something a little bit more clever, like this kind of uh, uh, regularization of the degree distribution I was talking about, so that you're getting a, a good spread and not just all on or all off or total saturation. So what are you doing right now? You just look at the tracks, and then you say there's a connection if they meet with each other? Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, what, what it would be saying was, uh, let me go back a little bit here. So if I went from my office to your office and I spent some time in your office, then the system would say that we, have, we know each other somehow or we've met or we've had some sort of social interaction. Um, but you need to go to other person's office. It's not that you can meet in a common area. That, that's true. Um, so it, it is conceivable with a tracklet to be able to do something to say these two people passed one another in the hall. And you could even tune it a little bit more finely and say, if they pass one another and stop in the hall and talk to each other for five minutes, then we consider that to be some sort of interaction. But right now, we're not doing that. Like, I think, but it could be done. I mean, you know, a very specific condition where you get a binary, you know, known or not known kind of interaction. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be office space, but it does have to be completely defined. Yeah. And I should say that we basically use that sort of binarization as a simplification to speed up the analysis. It was really easy to work on binary adjacency matrices. They have some very simple and regular properties that lend them to, like, really quick analysis. But we, you could easily start talking about, like, level of activity or amount Instead of it just being uh, one or zero, you could start looking at a floating point number. And then I think an entirely different set of methods would come into play. Perhaps uh, actually things that look a lot like image processing <laughs> bits, but where the image is image of kind of social network activity like uh, Tanzim had worked out before. Yeah, 
Basically, like, you know, the guy who sits next to my office is Dan, and Dan Bohus, and we kind of talk quite a bit, mm. but not over email at all. And since our offices are adjacent, we just yell at each other. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty interesting point, which is that people who are really socially connected may never email one another because it would be more convenient to use other. I think that you know there lies an opportunity in thinking about combining multiple modalities. One is, of course, your tracks, mm -hmm. but instead of sort of using email as a or the survey as a way of validating it, if you think of it as an auxiliary information, mm -hmm. you know, and then coming up with a social network that tries to support all these different modalities that you have observed. Yes, yeah. And then you can factor into account the distances from the offices and, uh, you know, things like those. Those we get into something more probabilistic, you know, yeah. so you know, depending on the, the track lists, uh, you know, what's the, what the likelihood like that these yeah. individuals know each other and, mm -hmm. and then come up with that. Uh, I think, that, yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Like, uh, you could start building a model of you know what a meeting is, and there's probably like the the average meeting, and then we can use Mahono Nobis distance to find like how far away from that meeting, or was that meeting from the average meeting, or is that some sort of strange spurious event? Those sorts of detectors, I think, re would really make this a lot more powerful. And of course, I mean, right now the system relies on having this kind of ubiquitous sensor network, which is not something which is going to appear anytime soon out in the world. But as Ashish was saying, by taking a lot of different sources and doing fusion. We're doing like a little bit of fusion between the email data set and the, the social networks yeah. data set. But, yep. And uh, have you thought of like once you have the social network, what can you do with it? Mm. Yeah, I think there's a couple different things. I mean, so a company like Facebook would probably use that sort of thing for recommendations. Like you probably know such and such a person or someone like Twitter would say, oh, you ought to follow this guy because somehow we have an indication that they would fit into your social network in a, in a meaningful way. So y you could use it just for referrals as the referral web project started. Then there are some sort of slightly more nefarious uses that you could use like, it for, which would be like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, building dossiers on people and things like that. But I, I think uh, because of the attitudes that I have about privacy, I probably would not encourage those sorts of applications. <laughs> How about if you want to influence the entire population? Then mm. what are the right people to choose? Yeah, well, so th then that becomes like centrality analysis by yeah. looking for most central figures in networks. You can sort of find points of influence. And uh, I mean, so here's the thing. Like, you talk about privacy, mm. but I see a potential. Like, for instance, like in a lot of developing countries, you have these social networks. But you need to spread some information about, you know, say, a vaccine for social good causes, right? Yes. Yeah. And then you have this kind of tension between privacy versus, you know, if you had something like your know, social network there, mm -hmm. you might be able to influence a lot of population, you know, with regards to things like development and health and, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, in, then you have this tension, right? It's mm -hmm. privacy can be a hinder, mm -hmm. right? I think a different approach to take to privacy in this situation, in addition to just designing with it as an element, would be actually to explicitly model the person's privacy. So suppose we have um, a, a, a graphical model of the, the social network, but we also include some intermediate node, which is the person's desire for privacy. So some people are like recluses. They don't want to be involved with these technologies or activities. And if you start sort of saying, okay, this person continually refuses or has no activity on these sorts of things, you might be able to begin to infer that this person is a private individual and we ought not to kind of tr try to track them and basically say, uh, okay, the person doesn't want to do this, so let's not annoy them. <laughs> that kind of approach. Yeah, see, the, the thing is, you know, all this analysis assumes that the individual has an awareness of privacy. Mm. Right? I mean, in many cases, you might find that, you know, like a lot of people on Facebook, I mean, of course, there are some people who are, who value their privacy and they know that that data is valuable. Mm. But a majority of, of them are just, you know, riding the bandwagon. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's always possible to mm. sort of evaluate the implications until very late. 
it's true. Sometimes people start to figure these things out. I, I've heard a lot of anecdotal cases of people who put like uh, embarrassing pictures on Facebook, and then later when they're seeking employment or other situations, like for instance, your parent becomes your friend on Facebook, and then suddenly they have access to this whole set of information about you that was really intended for an entirely different audience altogether. So you have these sorts of things which are like emerging <laughs> kind of social networking privacy problems, but I think, uh, yeah, the, there's a lot of thought that needs to be put into this and, and not just kind of automatically assuming that we should mine like things down to the hilt, but maybe we ought to kind of, yeah, pers you know, model users in a way which is respectful of the right to be left alone if people desire that. get all the information available online, even hidden stuff, mm -hmm. and like see like and have like some visualizations. Oh, you have all this video, but you have all this picture, and then then get an idea of like oh wow, all that maybe I need to and like have the possibility to get rid of some spots. So the, the difference between modeling the privacy uh, that you you know desire and the privacy that you've you know afforded through the internet and things like that would have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the other thing that comes to <laughs> my head is the following, right? Like. Having a telephone was a big deal in the early part of the century. Mm. And it was considered an invasion of privacy because you know someone else can ring a very loud device in your own house. Yeah. But like you know, we value what a phone brings to us. Absolutely. Right? And I think there is our trade-offs. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people are bargaining with privacy. So Paul Durish and Palin wrote an article which was basically saying that privacy is not kind of a one zero sort of thing, but it's really a little bit like what Katsi was talking about before. We're trying to sort of maintain a public image of ourself. And we are trying to regulate our boundary between ourself and our sort of public image. And so basically I think when people choose to like have a telephone in their house, they're saying like, well, I'm gonna be trading off a bit of my personal space and the ability of people to call me all the time for this thing which is very convenient and I accept that bargain. Like I, I think it's a, a good bargain to make. Um, I, I think a lot of people on Facebook are making that bargain. I, I myself like I am willing to put all sorts of information on Facebook because I think it helps me kind of get in better contact with a lot of my friends, even with the knowledge that some of the companies that Facebook is partnering with may use that information in ways that I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. Mm. Then the Facebook guys, I mean, they say in the media all the time that the assumption is that there's this uh, limited sum, you know, there's kind of a fixed sum privacy. And that, that threshold changes all the time with the technology so that, you know, I mean, Zuckerberg says, you know, people are sharing three to five percent more of their, their private information, you know, every year. And so one thing I wonder actually about your assessment is that, you know, you, with your prototype uh, uh, for this kind of um, sensor-based uh, uh, graph discovery, um, you know, you have an existing kind of... Uh, uh, um, idea of how people feel about this system but you know uh, uh, to me it was it didn't seem like people were so offended by it that it wouldn't be already far enough along on this kind of sliding scale that you would imagine that you know yeah maybe three five years from now you know this it seemed to me like this could be very acceptable mm -hmm. um, but uh, I mean you know uh, the creepiness is it's assessment seems very uh, uh, early based on how these things change very quickly once people have tools it's definitely true that maybe people's attitudes about how creepy this activity is will sort of evolve over time as people have more and more confrontations with automatic systems that are, you know, modeling it. Or it could be that, like, there, there's some creepy activities that have a lot of staying power no matter how long they've been, people have been doing them. A good example I would have would be spamming. Like, you know, people have been spamming each other for 20 years now, but people still don't like it. <laughs> And it isn't really a matter of changing social attitudes. It's just some sort of social activity that people really don't like. I'm not really sure that social networking modeling is in that area, but I think it can be a little bit on the boundary, and it depends a lot on how you're doing it. And probably it also depends a lot on what people get out of it. Like Ashish was saying, having a telephone in your home is a hard convenience to beat. If this is embedded in some system that gives you some you know, a, amazing transformative social advantage in your life, Maybe people would put up with it, but I think it has to be a pretty strong value for the per something really like uh, worthwhile for the person. Have you noticed any companies that exist that allows you to uh, uh, to uh, remove your data online and would mine everything and say, "Oh yeah, I don't have 
I did it, I did it, I did it. Well, you know, it's interesting in that um, there are some companies that are a little bit more proactive, uh, saying like, you know, um, there's actually a plugin I think for Firefox which scrambles your search strings with random search strings gathered from other people. It's a little bit like onion routing, which is a privacy preserving technology, but it has to do with like search engine profiling. So if someone looks at your browser, it looks like it's sending out a bunch of random noise and there's occasional real searches in there. Um, I know that actually in the EU, and I think in particular in Germany, there are some very specific data retention laws that say that you have the legal right to force a corporation to destroy their records about you. But that law doesn't exist in the same way in the US. So it would seem that if you were going to operate in the, that market, you would need to build in like a privacy kill switch <laughs> into your data records where the person could just say like, OK, I turn this thing off. Um, I'm uncertain actually about how certain companies are handling that. Like if you deactivate your profile on some products, I think some companies will delete the records and other companies will just archive them and allow you to reactivate it later. And it depends on. It's true. You can never destroy the web archive, at least that I know of right now. So it's. There it, should be a possibility. Like, mm. Mm. The, yeah, that, that, that gets interesting because there you have the, yeah, the, the rights of historians to create an accurate picture of what happened at a particular time versus the right of the individual to protect their own private kind of records. But I, I, I for instance, like I have some Usenet archive submissions that I wrote in high school that I would really like to get rid of, but I think that maybe it's too late. I'll just have to accept that. <laughs> All right, well, maybe we should yeah, wind down.